Josh, I'm one of the pastors here. Great to see you all here. Thanks, Coops. All right, let me get set up. Uh, just before I start, I uh, just want to say, uh, if you're coming on the weekend away, that is so great. Um, I have to give you a piece of news I've got to tell Coop to say. So listen now. Uh, hold on. Uh, you will have gotten an email. I'm sure you will check your emails regularly, but in case you didn't, you will have gotten an email saying that you need to fill out your uh, dietary form. If you don't do that by the end of tomorrow, uh, you won't get to eat. That's kind of important. So uh, feel free to you know, chuck that in a note on your phone or something. Just fill it in. You'll get food, especially if you're a dietary requirements, but everyone chuck that in. Awesome. Got to say that. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a story uh, of a time that I really wanted someone to accept me. Uh, particularly someone, I wanted someone to accept a date with me. Uh, this was back in year nine, and uh, the climax of the story happened just uh, one afternoon after school in the bus bay in front of all of my friends. Uh, but the thing to know about this story is you've got to know what happened a week beforehand. Uh, the week beforehand, I uh, went to a karate lesson, my first and only ever karate lesson. Uh, and the thing that I learned when I was there, I had to stand in front of a mirror and he taught me how to block punches. So he said, get your hands up, and when someone tries to punch you, you swat away in front, swat away in front. It's been about half an hour, you try to hit me with four noodles, and I have to try to block punches. Was a bit lame at the time, but I thought, hold on. This is a cool skill, an impressive skill that I can show this girl. If, she, if I can show that I can protect her, I can provide her, she will want to accept a date with me. Uh, so after school, our whole, uh, all of our friends go into the grass and the bus bay, and uh, I thought, this is the perfect time to show it. I said, uh, Jess, uh, try to punch me in the face. I don't know if you'll do it. Just, just try it. Don't, don't go as hard as you can, but try to punch me in the face. So here we go. This is my chance. So get in my stance. She goes to punch me. And in my excitement, I go to kind of hit her hand away, but a bit overexcited, and I backhanded her right across the face in front of all of my friends. Uh, she kind of cried a bit. Her face was red, and I was embarrassed. Uh, she ran off to the bus, and uh, she never accepted a date from me after that. Uh, we've all had times when we wanted to be accepted. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you're at work, maybe you're one of the younger people in your workplace and you really want to fit in and be accepted by your co-workers. Uh, I actually first started growing my beard because I wanted to be accepted by my co-workers and seem older and cooler. I don't know why. I thought it would work. And maybe you feel that. Uh, have you ever felt like maybe people won't accept you if they kind of find out that, that thing about you, that, that thing that's a bit weird or that thing you go... I'm not sure if, if they found out about that, they might not accept me. Ever felt like that? We all want to be accepted, and uh, sometimes the stakes of acceptance, they're not that high. Uh, you know, if a boy or a girl, if they don't accept you, it hurts and it's crushing, but eventually you move on. But other times, if, you know, if someone in your family doesn't accept who you are, it's, it's really, really painful. But tonight I want to say there's one person whose acceptance of you has the highest stakes possible, where the consequences don't just affect now, but they last forever. The question we're looking at tonight is, does God accept you? <clears throat> what does he think of you? One day we're all going to come face to face with God and he's going to either accept us or reject us. Will he accept you? When I was a teenager, someone asked me that question. They said, will God accept you into his kingdom? Uh, God's kingdom, that is the perfect place where God has set up to be with us forever. And this guy said to me, if you died tonight and God asked you why he should accept you, why he should accept you into his kingdom, what would you say? I'd never really thought about it before. And uh, he gave me a piece of paper with a line on it. It had zero at one end and ten at the other. And he said, I want you to write down a number between zero and ten of what chance do you think you have of God accepting you, accepting you into his kingdom right now? And uh, I've actually given you all an outline, so you should have that on your seat, a piece of paper, and it's got a line on it with zero at one end and ten at the other. I'd love for each of you to think now of something powerful about writing it down. If you didn't get one, you can write it in your phone. Write down a number between zero and ten of what chance you think you have of God accepting you, accepting you into his kingdom if you came face to face with him right now. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. And as you do it, think about the reason for why you would write that number. I'll give you 10 seconds.
All right, so keep that in your mind. Now, uh, when Bernie, when he asked me that question, I thought, well, I know a bunch of the answers at youth group. I, uh, I go to church. My parents, they, they took me to Sunday school when I was a kid. I was a, I was a pretty good kid. I didn't get into a lot of trouble. I haven't done any of the big sins. I didn't really know what they were, but I knew I hadn't done them. I thought, there's some pretty good reasons why God should accept me. And so I gave myself a seven. Uh, what number did you give your, your, yourself? Uh, and how do you feel about that number? So if you gave yourself a number that wasn't 10, does that scare you? That the end could come at any time and you don't know where you'll spend eternity. Uh, our life is kind of like a tiny dot on an infinitely long line that kind of goes forever. And if you don't know if God's going to accept you into his kingdom, that's kind of terrifying. If you did give yourself a 10, are you sure? How do you know? Uh, if you were on your deathbed, would you be so confident that you wouldn't even be scared? that you'd welcome death because you know that you're going to heaven. That's a lot of confidence. Is God going to accept you? It's a big question, probably the biggest question, because all of us should want to be part of God's kingdom. Uh, you might be thinking, I don't really care if God lets me into his kingdom. What does it matter? Well, it matters because God's kingdom is so good and the alternative is so bad. God's kingdom is so good and the alternative is so bad. If you take a look around you, you'll see that the world is far from perfect. There's terrible shootings, natural disasters, uh, incurable diseases, poverty, addiction, uh, suffering that everyone faces in life. Our world is totally broken. But God, he wants it to end. And he set up a place where none of those things will ever exist. God's kingdom. It's a place where we'll be face to face with God. No more crying, no more suffering, no more poverty, no more sickness. We'll all be with God's people in the perfect place where God has set up face to face with him forever. God's kingdom is so good. And the alternative is so bad. Eternal judgment where death and suffering reigns away from all of the good things that makes God's kingdom so good. If you don't want to be in the kingdom, if that isn't the number one place you want to be, you don't know how good it is. And tonight we're going to meet a guy called Nicodemus, and, and he thought that God had accepted him. He thought he was in with God and his kingdom. But by the end of the passage, we realize that he's not. He thought he was going to heaven, but he finds out he's going to hell. And that is really scary, because if Nick isn't in, how do I know if I am? How do I know if I'm a zero or a ten? How do I know if God will accept me or not? It's a big question, and this passage gives us the answer. It's great that you've come to church this evening. John chapter 3 is all about how do we enter the kingdom of God? How will God accept us? And the answer is in two parts. So we'll look at the first part of the story. Point one, you have to be born again. Have a look at the first sentence. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the, uh, a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So uh, there's this guy, Nick. He, he's a Pharisee, which is kind of like the church leader of the day. Basically, you can picture, insert your favorite minister here. I won't get you to say out loud who it is. If anyone could enter the kingdom, it would be this guy. Uh, he was incredibly religious. He knew the Bible. He gave money to church. He did good things. He was a good guy, better than you. Everyone knew that Nick was an awesome guy. Uh, if you asked Nick what number he would have written out of 10, he would have said 11. If you asked all of his friends, they would have said 12. Everyone knew that Nick would be accepted by God into his kingdom. But look at what Jesus said to him. Have a look at uh, sentence number three again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus is the king of the kingdom, and so Jesus is the one who decides who is in God's kingdom and who's out. And Jesus says there's one thing that decides whether you're in or out. Are you born again? Jesus says that's the only thing that matters. What's that? 
You have to be born again, Jesus? Uh, Nick was probably thinking, hey, Jesus, you might have been asleep when we were at school and we learned about how babies work. It's kind of a one-way thing. Once they come out, they can't go back in. It doesn't work like that. What's he talking about? Have a look at sentence number five. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, Jesus, he's not talking about physical birth. He's talking about something else. He says, to be born again means to be born of water and the Spirit. That's how you get accepted into God's kingdom. Well, what does that mean? How, how does that help us at all? Well, Jesus is quoting an old prophecy from the book of Ezekiel, and it's a prophecy where God says how he will make his people acceptable to him. I'm going to read it for you. It's going to come up on the screen. It's from the book of Ezekiel. It says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse from you all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Being born again, it means two things. It means you need to be washed and you need the Holy Spirit. You need to be washed, you need the Holy Spirit. We'll look at those two things. First, it means you need to be washed. You need to have your sins washed away. Now, uh, sin is a word you might have heard of before. Uh, when the Bible talks about sin, it says that sin is a wrong order problem. Sin is putting ourselves first and putting God last. See, God, he made the world and he made us. He's the ruler of the world. And since God made it all, he's number one over everything. But he made us to be his number two. And the Bible tells us that sin is when we get that order wrong, when we make ourselves number one instead of God. It's something we do all the time. We do it when we do what we want to do instead of what God wants us to do. We put ourselves first. Uh, we live our lives trying to figure out what's going to make me happy with no regard for God. We decide to drive over the speed limit because that's what I want to do. Uh, we get angry at someone because they've transgressed the things that make me mad. Uh, we lie to avoid getting in trouble because I've got to keep looking good because I need to be number one. We put ourselves first all the time. And that's sin. And putting ourselves first, it breaks our relationship with God. It's what he made us for. And this sin, Jesus says, makes us dirty, makes us filthy, which is a huge problem because God is completely clean and pure and holy. And so because of our dirty sin, we cannot be near the holy God. We cannot be part of his kingdom. Our sin actually means that each of us have a zero out of 10 chance when it comes to being accepted by God into his kingdom on our own. We can't be accepted into the kingdom unless our sins are washed away. We need to be washed. Uh, one of my friends a little while ago got engaged to a Chinese girl and he told me that the story about meeting her parents for the first time. And uh, he went over to her parents' place and went to walk in the house and they said, no, 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 no. You've got to come back out. Your shoes are dirty. You've got to take off your shoes, wear these special slippers so you can be clean in the house. Uh, you might have this at your house, but he certainly hadn't done this before. You can't go into the house unless you're clean. That's a little bit what it's like when our sin, with our sin, when we come before God. We can't walk into God's house dirty. See, if we can't walk into another person's house with dirt in our shoes, how much less can we come before the God of the universe when we are completely covered in sin. But we can't get rid of our dirt just by changing our shoes. Now, not even kind of one of these high-pressure hoses is going to work. We need to spiritually be washed from head to toe. You need to become a brand new person who's completely clean. And that's why you need to be born again. Because being born again washes away your sin. That's the first thing. Being born again washes us from our sin. But uh, that's only half the story. Uh, secondly, being born again means having the Holy Spirit give you a new heart. We need the Holy Spirit to give us a new heart. See, uh, you know how the heart kind of pumps blood around your body? 
the Bible says we have sinful hearts that pump sin all around our body. Every sin comes from our heart. Uh, every thought and word and action comes from our sinful hearts. And having a heart that pumps sin around our bodies means we cannot be with God in his kingdom. And Jesus says, if you want to be accepted by God and be in his kingdom, you need a completely new heart. Sorry, give me a sec. You need a new heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you a new heart. A heart that doesn't reject God, a heart that wants to listen to and live for God. When God says you need to be born of water and spirit, he's talking about the two things that need to happen if you want to be accepted by God, born again. You need your sins washed away, and you need the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart. Otherwise, you cannot be accepted by God. Who here likes Coke? Put your hand up if you love Coke. I love Coke. If you don't love Coke, something's wrong with you. This is the sweetest, best kind of 10 teaspoons of sugar of black caffeinated goodness you can have. It's good, Dave. Does anyone want some Coke right now? Hold on. It's good stuff. Now, uh, I brought some um, manure, some fertilizer along. It's got all the good stuff in it. It's got some poo in it. It's got, what else does it have? Lots of good stuff. Now, if I take some of this and put it in the Coke, there we go. What's going to happen here? Hopefully it doesn't fizz everywhere. It's kind of the same color as Coke. All right. Swirl it around a little bit. Who wants the Coke now? Does anyone... I thought there'd be someone who'd say they'd still want it. You're gross if you do. No one wants it, right? There's something wrong with it. What's wrong with it? It's got bits of poo in it, right? It's got dirt, it's got manure, it's ruined. There's nothing I can do to fix it, right? If I kind of poured it into another cup, is that going to help? No, it's kind of all mixed in now. The dirt's in the can. Maybe I try to kind of scoop the bits out. There's nothing you can do. It's totally ruined. The poo particles are kind of already mixed in. That is kind of what it's like with sin. It's totally ruined us. It's ruined us for being able to come to God and enter his kingdom. You can't fix it. You can't separate it. You can't get a sieve and make it better. Some people just say, well, I'll do better tomorrow. I'll turn over a new leaf and that'll kind of make God acceptable, uh, me acceptable to God. But that's like saying, well, I'll just, I'll just pour the Coke through the sieve and maybe I'll just get some of the bad bits out. No, it's completely in the can. The sin is completely in our heart. It doesn't fix the problem. You can't fix the problem. The thing that you need is a totally new can. That's the only thing you can do. We need to be made completely brand new people. We need to be born again. We need to have our sins completely washed away, and we need God's spirit in us. Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't be accepted into God's kingdom. So the obvious question is, how does that happen? How can you be born again? I want it, but I can't make it happen. Well, that's Nick's next question. Sentence number nine, he says, how can these things be? What's going on? I don't understand. How do you do it? Sorry, my throat's going. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I don't want the death trap coke. All right, what's going on? Well, Jesus answers by telling a kind of weird story from the Old Testament. Have a look at sentence number 14. He says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What's he talking about? There's this event right back in the Old Testament, a time when God's people are walking in the desert, and they come across hundreds and hundreds of poisonous snakes. One of my absolute nightmares. Snakes everywhere, and whoever got bitten was going to die. A totally desperate situation. But uh, God, he told Moses, get a pole, put a bronze snake at the top of it, and just lift it up in front of the people. And uh, he says, if anyone gets bitten, look at the snake on top of that pole, and if you believe and look at it, you will live. 
And it worked. The people who believed it would save them were healed. They didn't die. It was amazing. Incredible. And Jesus brings up this story now to give us a clue about how to be born again. See, like Israel in the wilderness, we are in a totally desperate situation. Death is in front of us. We're in a place far from God, like Israel in the desert. And Jesus says the only way to live is to believe in what God says will save us. Back in the day, it was the bronze snake lifted up on the pole that would save them. But today, it's Jesus who was lifted up on the cross to die in our place. Everyone who believes in Jesus will be born again. See, Jesus, the only person who never sinned, the only person who deserves to be accepted by God, he died. He experienced the punishment of God's rejection that we deserve. He was lifted up on a cross and killed to take the punishment that we deserve so we can be accepted by God. He died to wash our sins away. He died to give us the Holy Spirit so we can be born again. It is incredible news. Does anyone know what this picture is? I put it up there. Yell it out if you know what it is. The camera app on your phone. We've got another slide. What's the next one? What's that one? Voice memos. Voice memos. Got one more? Notes. Notes. One more after that. Does anyone know what that one is? Mind what everything you've done has been caught on this camera and put into the notes section of my phone. Uh, it's seen exactly what you're like at home when nobody's watching. It's seen how you treat your family. It's captured what you say when you're stuck in traffic. Uh, it's seen everything that you've ever done or said or thought. Who would you want to see this phone? Uh, your husband or your wife? Your mum or your dad? Uh, would you want to come up to the front of church and kind of show us a video up on the big screen? God has this phone. He knows us and he knows our sin. When God looks at this phone, do you think he sees someone who deserves to be accepted into his kingdom? Not if he's looking at mine and not when he looks at yours. But Jesus, he came to wipe this phone clean, right? Even the metadata is kind of completely gone. And it's not just forgotten, it's dealt with. Jesus, who never sinned, comes and says, give me all of your sin. Put it on me. I'll take, this, I'll take your sin. I'll take the punishment, and I will take the punishment that goes with it. You can have a fresh start. You can have your sins washed away and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> oh, Sorry. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. Jesus paid for it. He came to wash you clean and give you the Holy Spirit. He came to give you a new heart. That's why if you want to get into the kingdom, you have to believe in Jesus. That's what John 3.16 is all about. Have a look. John 3.16. <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus says there's only two options. Believe in him or not. If you do, you'll be born again and have eternal life in God's kingdom. He says if you don't, sentence 17 and 18, you stand condemned in your sin, cut off from God and his kingdom. Not sure where you're at tonight. You might have been coming to church your whole life. Uh, maybe this is your first time. But maybe you know you've been living like Nick, thinking that you're good with God, or at least you're kind of a 7 out of 10. But tonight you've realized that you need Jesus. You've realized that God has this phone, and that means that you can't be accepted into his kingdom, not on your own. You're actually a 0 out of 10. You need to be born again. You need to have your sins washed away and you need a new heart. You've got to believe in Jesus. If that's you, then on the outline, that piece of paper you've got, there's a prayer. You can pray that at any time. They're not magic words. They'll just help you to talk to God, to say that you're sorry for your sin and that you want to believe in Jesus so you can be accepted by him into his kingdom. If you do that, you can have 10 out of 10 confidence that God will accept you because you've been born again. 
It's incredible. You should do it. Don't leave tonight without doing it if you're thinking about it. But maybe you're someone who already believes in Jesus, and if that's you, that is awesome. Rejoice and have confidence that you have 10 out of 10 certainty that God accepts you. You are so privileged. But maybe that's not you. Maybe you're, you're interested or you're not yet convinced. If that's you, I want to urge you, come back to church next week. Ask questions more. This is too big to not want to find out more. Jesus says he's the only way to be accepted by God. It's worth finding out if he's right. Please investigate more. Because for you, the only number you can write at the moment is zero. But Jesus is waiting with open arms for anyone to come to him, to believe and be part of his amazing kingdom. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much that even though we've rejected you, that even though we've put ourselves first, that you sent Jesus to save us. We are dirty in our sin. We have hearts that disobey you. Thank you so much that Jesus came to live a perfect life, that he died to take the punishment for our sin so that if we believe in you, we can be accepted into your kingdom and into your family. Help us to know this. Help us to love this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.